Hi everyone, and welcome to the Help Medic. You're watching episode 3 of our series, How to Interpret 12 Lead ECG, where we're talking about the PR interval. So we'll be talking about what it is, how long it should be, and what could cause it to be shorter or longer than usual. Let's get right into it. So, last time we spoke about the P wave and what that can tell us and what information we can get from it. Today we're speaking about the PR interval, right? which is this section here on an ECG, from the beginning of the P wave right to the start of the QRS complex. And the way we think about it is if the P wave is the driver of the car, right? that is the whole ECG, then the PR interval tells us about the road. Right? So the P wave tells us who is in control the PR interval tells us what the conditions are like on the road. Now, a normal PR interval is 120 to 200 milliseconds, right? Which is three to five small blocks. Right? Now, the way I like to think about it is, again, in terms of a road. So if the PR interval is too long, so it's more than five blocks, it means that there's a roadblock somewhere around here. And if the PR interval is too short, so it's less than three blocks before you get to the QRS complex, it means that there's a shortcut path that isn't supposed to be there. So first, we're going to talk about the short PR interval and what that tells us. And we can call this the pre-excitation syndrome, where the ventricles contract too quickly. Now, usually, there's an impulse that goes from the SA node right, down through the atria towards the AV node. Right, processed by the AV node, then proceeds down through the septum, and that's when we get ventricular contraction. Right? Now the AV node is sort of the rate limiter in this step. The impulse has to travel from the SA node to the AV node and then down through there. Normally there's a solid gate-like barrier separating atria and the ventricles and the only path through is the AV node. Now with pre-excitation with a short PR interval, what that means is somewhere along here or anywhere along that path, there's a shortcut. There's a break in that isolation of the atria and ventricles. And so this impulse, instead of going to the AV node, takes a shortcut, cuts through the barrier, and excites the ventricles prematurely. And we call that pre-excitation. And the way we see that in an ECG is a short PR interval, where the time from year is less than three. Okay, so we spoke about the pre-excitation being a shortcut, right? Now let's talk about the long PR interval. When you have a long PR interval, it's actually called heart block. But well, there are three degrees of heart block, and we start with first degree. And I like the roadblock analogy, so I'm going to commit to it and use it for the rest of this video. So it's like being at a roadblock where everyone's treated the same. Everyone's held for a little bit longer than usual, and then you carry on. So every car gets held for the same amount of time. But they're all held up. So the way this works is you've got every single P wave having a long PR interval, right? but the PR interval is the same for each P wave. And that means that you've got a prolonged PR interval, but it's not changing. Every P wave is still the same. The only thing you'll notice on a first degree heart block um, ECG is if you actually measure out the PR interval from the beginning of the P wave the beginning of the QRS complex and notice that it's more than five blocks, or you could miss it. Now the thing is, first degree heart block has a cause. It's not just there, it has a cause. And if you don't find it, it can lead to more serious complications. So you need to be able to recognize it. Okay, now that we know about first degree heart blocks, let's talk about second degree heart blocks, right? Now, second degree heart blocks are actually split into two types. So, th so there's Mobitz type one, which is also called Wenkebach, because two people discovered the same thing. And there's Mobitz type two, we're going to talk about Mobitz type 1 first. Right? Mobitz type 1 is still like being stuck at a roadblock, but, you know, every car that goes by, the cops get more and more annoyed, so they keep you longer and longer. Right? And the PR interval keeps on getting progressively longer until, all of a sudden, there's no QRS complex, just another P wave. And then the pattern starts over. They start keeping you longer and longer until eventually someone doesn't make it through when they get pulled over. That's Mobit type 1, that's Finkerbach, where as you go on this ECG, you'll see that the PR interval gets progressively longer and longer and longer until eventually there's no QRS complex. Just skipped QRS 
and then all of a sudden period interval starts getting longer and longer and longer again. That's Mobitz type 1. Right? That is predictable, you can see it coming, it goes longer, 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 skipped. Right? Now Mobitz type 2 is slightly different. Right? Mobitz type 2 is again you're at a roadblock and the cops are annoyed. Right? But you don't actually know if they're going to be annoyed at you or not, there's no pattern to it. So every now and then they just pull off a car and no one can tell why. So in Mobitz type 2 there's actually a uniform PR interval. It may be long, it may be normal, you actually don't know. But every now and then there'll be a skipped QRS complex. But the P wave stays constant. Now, I'm not drawing in the ST segments and the T wave just for you know clarity's sake. But and you'll see there's no actual predictability to how many beats it's gonna be before you know there's a skipped QRS. In Mobitz type 2, it's unpredictable. You don't know when the cops are gonna pull you over. You don't know what you may have done wrong. The PR interval can be long or it can be normal. You don't know. You, you'll see it on the ECG. Maybe long, maybe normal. But every few beats, you'll see a skipped QRS complex. And you won't be able to determine what the pattern is. There won't be a, oh, every three beats there's a skipped QRS or every five beats. It's any time. There could be one beat between, then four, then three, then two, then one. It's unpredictable. And that's what makes it dangerous. Now what makes Mobitz Type 2 heart block even more dangerous is that it can quickly go on to a third degree heart block. Right? Now a third degree heart block is like a total separation. Right? Here's your road block, here's your road. Right? The cars on this side of the road block have no relation to the cars on this side of the road block. There's absolutely no relation. Right? Now, in terms of the ECG what that means is the atria and the ventricles are totally electrically separated. The impulses firing from the SA node that would normally go through the AV node to the ventricles are blocked off. They can't get through. Right? So, wait, but the ventricles are still contracting. How's that happening? So what happens is, the, usually the AV node takes over. Now the AV node is releasing impulses to, you know, contract the ventricles. But the SA node keeps firing. Right? And what happens when the SA node keeps firing? You get P waves. Right? The SA node is firing on its own schedule giving you P waves, right? regularly giving you P waves. Assume that's regular, just please. Now, in that time, the P waves are not getting through, so the SA node keeps firing. But now the AV node says, okay, cool, I still got to release impulses for the ventricles, so it releases QRS complexes, also at regular schedules. But what you'll notice is the AV node impulses have pretty much nothing to do with the impulses from the SA node. So you can actually get something like this, where the SA node and the AV node release an impulse at the same time, and you get one amalgamated beat. Right? And this is what a third degree heart block looks like. At first sight you may think, ah, oh, there's a long PR interval, or there's a short PR interval. But if you actually look and you pay attention, you'll notice that there's actually no real PR interval at all. There are P waves going, and the P waves are regular. They're going at the same regular rate, same distance between P waves. And then, more often than not, the QRS complexes are the same distance between QRS complexes. So you can see that the QRS complexes are related. The P waves are all related. But there's no relation between the two. Like, no relation between P wave and QRS. And that's the marker of a third degree heart block. And the dangerous part about third degree heart blocks is that because the ventricles are not getting any stimulation from the SA node, right? they're now on a backup pacemaker. If something happens to the AV node or there's dysfunction in the ventricles, you can actually get contractile dysfunction of the ventricles and you can end up going into congestive cardiac failure because the ventricles are not getting impulses to contract readily enough. And that's why third degree heart block is dangerous. That's why you need to know about the PR interval. So last episode we spoke about the four questions that you talk about regarding the P wave. Right? Now, actually there are five questions and the last one's to do with the PR interval, but you can combine them into one question. Right? So, in standard lead two, is there an upright P wave that has a one-to-one -one relationship with each QRS complex with a normal PR interval? If you can say yes to that, then it's very likely that your impulse comes from the SA node and that there's no heart block. So that's great. 
So yeah, that's about it for the PR interval. Next time we'll be talking about tachycardias and the types of pacemakers and types of tachycardias you can see on ECG. So be sure not to miss that. Hope you've enjoyed the episode. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you again next time.